Oh, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to uh, be with you and great that you're with us as we continue to do uh, church online. We value all of our online uh, viewers and it's great that you're joining in with us. And uh, our prayer is, of course, that um, through this ministry you'll grow in your uh, knowledge and faith of the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour and King. Uh, one of the great places to find out about how Jesus is that king is in a little book in Col a Bible called Colossians and uh, that little book in the New Testament has some big, big truths in it. One of the, one of the big things that uh, we find in that, that little book is that Jesus is a very supreme being, a very superior being, a supreme saviour. Uh, the big things we long for in life are really only appropriated uh, by faith in Jesus, actually. Uh, take, for example, forgiveness. The human soul longs to be forgiven, but it's only as we are brave enough to peel back the defences, to expose the guilt and be honest that we have offended God, that we can expect to experience his peace and his rest in our hearts. Let me uh, read to you from uh, the Psalms. And Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5, has something terrific to say about forgiveness. Uh, let me read to you. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged you, my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So let us think uh, deeply about the sorts of things that are found in faith in Jesus, the big things that we need in life. In fact, you could say that uh, the greatest need of all forgiveness is found in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as great as my sins are, it is a great and additional sin to refuse to rest in that gracious offer you've extended to us for forgiveness by faith in Jesus. This day, we pray, grant us the blessedness and release of knowing that we are completely, absolutely, freely forgiven through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, there's nothing like uh, singing for Christians. We love to sing about the good things that uh, we have in Jesus. Here's a song called, Yet Not I, But Through Christ In Me, from a band called City Alight. Oh 
Please bow with me in prayer now as we come before our, our great God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how good and kind and merciful you are. Though you have every right to judge all of us and all creation as a result of our sin, you demonstrate your justice in the person of your own dear Son. In an act of severe mercy, you let your anger fall upon him in order to let us escape and not treat us as our sins really deserve. Your love trumps your judgment. Once your enemies, now we're welcomed at your table through faith in Jesus. And for this, we want to love and adore you with everything we are and everything we have. We want to say thank you, Jesus, that you were obedient to death for our sakes. Thank you that you made all the earth, that you put the stars in their places, that you came and walked among us as one of us, that though you give life to all, you gave yours for us, that though you are the peace of this world, you succumb to violence and death for our sakes at the cross. Forgive us, Father, for forgetting that Jesus deserves our all, Forgive us for treating him so lightly, as if he's an optional extra in life. Forgive us for being lukewarm. Forgive us for placing more importance on things and ourselves and our plans instead of seeking you and your kingdom and your way. Forgive us for drinking from other wells besides the one that gives eternal life. 
and quenches our spiritual thirst. Wells that fail us and from which we never find satisfaction, we continually go back to. Reassure us today, we pray, of your great love for sinners like us. Quicken us to live in the light of the grace and power of the risen Lord Jesus, to believe it and receive it. Let us rise up with cleansed consciences, not forgetting what he's done for us and how he has provided for our every need, hope for tomorrow and help for today. Our Father, we come to you as you invite us to come, We're needy, broken, desperate, dry, thirsty, hungry, doubting and confused. We draw near to you that you may draw near to us. And as we come, we find that you've loved us deeply in the person of Jesus, that he doesn't turn any one of us away. And he won't break a bruised reed or snuff out a smouldering wick, for our Lord is gentle and his yoke is light. Father, thank you that our brother Jesus took upon himself all our sins and griefs, all our sorrows, all our pain and our darkness. Thank you that you've made us and made known to us even before we've known you, that you understand us, how we are made of dust, how sin has ravaged our lives, brought death and destruction to our experience. Thank you that in Jesus you provided everything we need for healing and wholeness. That by faith in him we are forgiven and made free. And more than that, actually, he made sons and daughters and adopted into your loving embrace as children precious to you. You know all our needs and asks and pleadings before we ask. Nevertheless, uh, we come in faith and pray and uh, we pray uh, in the first place for all those in government and in leading this country and the nations of the world. We pray for leaders. We pray that their wisdom might not be the wisdom of the world or may not be men, man's wisdom, but wisdom from the Lord. Father, we pray for good government, government that is godly and God-fearing. Uh, so we, we commit our leaders to you commit Scott Morrison to you and we commit our premiers as they deal with the crises that our country and indeed most of the world is in at the moment. We ask you that uh, you would guide them with uh, good wisdom, good decisions. Father, we pray for those struggling with loss and grieving. Comfort them with the hope that uh, Jesus himself knows their suffering and grief. We pray for those who are dealing with sickness and an unknown future. Grant that they would know your peace in a fresh and abundant measure every day. Uh, we, we pray for those with mental health conditions. Uh, grant that they might draw on the light and peace that Jesus sheds into our hearts and minds for wellness. Father, we pray uh, for our... Um, coffee in the car park this weekend and we ask that um, and for the next uh, week months ahead we pray that this event will be a great way of bringing uh, people into um, con connection with our with our congregation here we pray that you would bring visitors that we would uh, make the the joy and the light of Christ known from from this place as people enjoy our building and our premises here Father, none could have predicted the days we're going through right now. Well, your word tells us that a world in chaos is all we can expect because um, of our rebellion and that mankind has rejected your rule. But we see your good and merciful hand extended to all who are filled with uncertainty in the person of Jesus. Yours is an arm of strength, protection and salvation for all who turn to you in these days. We ask you to be our shield, our rock, our deliverer. We pray and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. 
Well, boys and girls, I hope that you're all buckled in, ready to go, because we have another exciting episode from Quizworks. And you know what Quizworks have been talking about, don't you? I'm sure that uh, you've seen them already, and they've been talking about Jesus' mission. I wonder if you can remember the actions for the mission of Jesus, that people from all around the world would hear about the risen King Jesus and put their trust in him. So I wonder if you can learn something new about him today. Buckle in, here we go. Hi everyone, I'm Chrissy. Well, over the past few weeks at QuizWorks Home Delivery, we've been looking at the awesome book of Acts. Now the book of Acts is all about Jesus' mission. And Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would hear that Jesus is the King. And Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would accept Jesus as their King. Stop! Oh, Rocco, hi. Oh, well, hi, Chrissy. You need to stop. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm practicing for my job at a construction site. It's oh. so cool. I get to tell people when they have to stop and when they can go. Check it out. Stop. Go. Stop. Go. Stop. Okay, that's great. Oh, it's pretty cool, right? It's very cool, Rocco. Oh, thank you. So what are you up to? Well, I'm about to tell everyone more about Jesus' unstoppable mission from the book of Acts. Really? An unstoppable mission? That's right. The book of Acts helps us see, why don't you do it with me, that the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Well, Chrissy, I think you need to stop. But all I've said is that the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Exactly. Stop right there. Why? Well, safety first. You're at a construction site, so you've got to need to be safe. I have to wear this? Yeah, it's part of the job. You know, something could fall on your head. All right, fine. Yeah. Secondly, you've just made a very big claim. I need you to stop and I need you to back it up. Well, okay then. Now, we've already seen in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit helped Peter tell thousands of people about the risen King Jesus. Oh, yeah, even though he used to be a big scaredy cat. That's right. And then last week we heard that Peter and John healed a lame man and then spoke to people about the risen King Jesus. Oh, well, stop. It can't be that easy all the time, can it? Ah, well, you're right. It wasn't always easy. But oh. even in the hard times, Jesus' mission would not be stopped. No way. Yes, way. And I'm going to tell you... The true story from Acts 6 and 7, which will help us see that even when people try to stop the mission, the mission of Jesus will go on. All oh, stories, I love stories. Well, I know you do. Now, this true story is about a man named Stephen. Stephen's job was to make sure that everyone in the church who was poor had everything they needed. Oh, well, stop. See, now, if that was Stephen's job, well, I mean, he'd have no time to tell anyone about the risen King Jesus. He'd be too busy trying to feed everyone. No, you're wrong, Rocco. Even though it was Stephen's job to look after the poor and the needy, he also did great miracles and spoke to people about the risen King Jesus. Oh. But some people didn't like what Stephen was saying and doing, and they started to argue with him. Whoa, stop. See, now that would definitely stop him. Uh-uh-uh, the mission cannot be stopped. Stephen won the argument. Ooh, okay. But then some people started telling lies about Stephen and about Jesus, and then Stephen was arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin? <laughs> the Sanhedrin. Oh. They were the leaders of the Jewish community and one of the most important groups in Jerusalem. Oh, well, that's a big stop. You see, now, if Stephen was brought before them, he'd be too scared to tell anyone about Jesus now. Well, I'm sure it was pretty scary, but the mission of Jesus cannot be stopped. Stephen didn't stay silent. In fact, Stephen launched into a big speech explaining how all throughout history, people had tried to stop the mission. But then Stephen explained that no matter what people did, Jesus' mission would not stop. And then Stephen said to the people, 
you are doing the same thing. You are trying to stop God's message. You even killed God's own son, Jesus. Oh, well, stop, stop, stop. Now, if he said that to them, they'd be furious. Well, you're right. They were so mad that they, well, they killed Stephen. They did? Well, that's horrible. You're right, it is. But don't you see, Chrissy, then the mission of the risen King Jesus has been stopped. Well, no. No? No. See, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, we read this. But Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked towards heaven where he saw our glorious God and Jesus standing at his right side. So in other words, as Stephen was dying, he looked up and he saw that Jesus was the king. Stephen got to see that Jesus still ruled. Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, it really is. It was like, it was like a sign for Stephen to know that the mission of the risen King Jesus really cannot be stopped. Even if people killed the messengers? Yeah, even then. Whoa. So then I guess the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. That is right, Rocco. Oh, that's amazing. Well, it looks like it's time for my lunch break. Oh, I'm just going to give you oh, that. Me? Yeah, you're totally qualified. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. I'll see you later. Sure. Bye, Rocco. Bye. Well, over the next few weeks at QuizWorks Home Delivery, we will continue to see how the mission of Jesus continued to spread. But today we've been reminded that it won't always be easy to speak about Jesus. Sometimes people will try to stop us. But Jesus is the risen King. And so do it with me. The mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Well, make sure you check out our Digging Deeper devotionals and our games, activity sheets, craft ideas at www.quizworks.com forward slash home delivery. And keep praying about and asking for opportunities for you to be involved in Jesus' unstoppable mission by telling people about the risen King Jesus. See you soon. Well, wasn't that great? I hope you enjoyed QuizWorks and I hope you're learning the actions to that little mission of Jesus too. It might be good to be able to tell people about that one day. Well, I hope uh, we've got your Bibles ready and open. We're about to have two readings today and uh, if you could follow with them in your Bibles, it would be terrific. First one's from Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18 and the second will be from Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 to 15. And after those readings, uh, Mark will come and explain the Colossians passage to us. Hello, everyone. It's great to open, open up God's Word with you today. God's Word is amazing, isn't it? How wonderful of God to give us such good scriptures to help us live life together in a community of faith in this world. This world is strong, so strong, too strong for us. We need all of God's help and um, he certainly gives us the invisible armour to wear to protect us from attacks that come in this world. So let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. It's on this, this very topic of the armour of God. Starting at verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And in 
pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Trust that the Lord will bless these words to you from his word. Hi everybody, I'm reading today from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 6 to 15, and my beautiful camera lady is my eldest daughter. Alive in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Thank you. Well, please open your Bibles to Colossians as we come and look at God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, that we can open this letter. Uh, we thank you that it's written not only for the Colossians, but also for us. So uh, give us hearts and minds to receive your word now. Point us to the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, sometimes battles change the course of history. Uh, in 490 BC, the Greeks faced off against the Persian invaders, and the Greeks won. Uh, despite being outnumbered, the Greeks led a forward attack that caused the Persian army to uh, pack up their bags, flee and, and panic and uh, go back to their ships. More than 6,000 Persians were slaughtered compared to less than 200 of the Greeks. Uh, the French won the siege of Orleans in May 1429 and their win saved France from centuries of English rule. I'm sure they're pretty happy about that. And then the invasion of Normandy by the Allied forces on D-Day in 1944 marked the beginning of the Nazis' decline on the Western Front. Well, in Colossians 2, 8 to 15, we read of another victory and the spoils are there for us to see. It was a total victory that changed the course of history. It was a victory uh, at the most unexpected of places, a victory on a Roman cross. Thousands were not slaughtered, only the blood of one man was shed. And yet the death of this man changed history forever. Well, today, as we continue in the book of Colossians, we look at Christ's victories and how they shape the way that we live. Uh, when the Conservatives win government, it shapes the way that we live in society. When the Lefts win government, it also shapes the way we live. And Christ now reigns victorious and he shapes the way we live. So I thought today we'd start uh, with verses 13 to 15, which describe the breadth of Christ's victory. In these verses, Paul outlines the triumph of the cross. Then verses 8 to 12 implore us to live in the light of that cross. So I've sort of changed the order a little bit today of the passages, uh, hopefully to bring out the main points and make them clearer. The big idea of Colossians 8 to 15 reads this way. Since you have been 
For since you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, see to it that no one takes you captive because God has made you alive in Christ. Alive in Christ, the joy of our salvation and the source of our thankfulness. Look with me at uh, verse 13 in chapter 2. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. Gospel truth. Having put your faith in Christ Jesus, God made you alive in Christ. Once you were dead in your sins, dead, absolutely dead, you were gone, you were lifeless, hopeless, you were condemned, and then God made you alive in Christ. You contributed nothing except, except the stench of your deadness, and God made you alive in Christ. Now, right at this moment, as you're watching, you might not feel particularly alive. It's hard to feel alive if you've got arthritis or after cancer treatment or, or with a frail heart or after a variety of surgical procedures. It's hard to have that feeling of life. It's hard to feel alive if you're suffering from anxiety or depression. It's hard to feel alive when medication makes you constantly sleepy or, or in the wake of family tragedy. But even if you feel worn out and depleted, in Christ, God treats you as alive. This is your standing before God. In Christ, you are alive. And although you may not feel alive, you are alive in Christ. You share the spoils of Christ's victory. And Paul explains in our passage how this happens, how one minute you were dead and the next minute you were alive in Christ. Look with me. He forgave all our sins, verse 14, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away nailing it to the cross. God took something away. Well, what did he take away? He took away our condemnation. God removed the debt we owe him. Uh, I call this the great removal because it is the great removal. Uh, the NIV says that God cancelled the written code, that he took this away. The ESV, I think, is a little closer when it says God cancelled our record of debt. In the first century, um, there was a legal document called the Chiagraphon. It was a certificate of debt. It was a handwritten record of debt. It was a common way of tracking debt in the ancient world before we had uh, credit cards and afterpay. So if you owed someone money, in a polite Roman world, you received a certificate of debt. Now, sin means that each of us, before God, were carrying a certificate of debt, a debt payable by our life. Now see what God has done. Verse 14 says that God cancelled our debt. Now, well, that's a little bit of an understatement, really. A strong, robust translation says that God obliterated our debt, that he smashed our debt, that he tore it in the bits, and it is no more. Our certificate of debt was snatched from us and nailed to the cross. Uh, when our son Chris uh, left Tamworth, we needed, well, he needed some money to buy a car, so uh, having wonderful parents, of course, uh, we lent him the money to buy a decent car. And we gave, in effect, we gave Chris uh, a certificate of debt and he promised to pay the money back. And to his absolute credit, he did pay the money back and uh, we're so happy about that. On the cross, Christ paid our debt. Our, certifi our certificate of debt was obliterated on the cross. God forgave us and he made us alive in Christ. Uh, at a college graduation ceremony I was reading about in America, the speeches were being made and there was one speech that was made that grabbed everyone's attention. Robert F. Smith 
uh, who evidently uh, has a fair amount of money, announced that his family would establish a grant to pay off every student loan for all the 400 students that were sitting there. Well, you can imagine the cheers, can't you? They were screaming in the aisles. The gift was estimated to be worth about 40 US million dollars. Imagine having your school or university debts obliterated by a generous donor. Yet how much more generous was Jesus who paid our debt with his life? As the Apostle Peter says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you are healed. The breadth of victory won for us on the cross. Debts removed, sins forgiven, and now we are alive with Christ. Oh, this victory, friends, doesn't stop there, it's a, for it's a victory which extends outwards through the whole of creation, which extends to powers and principal, um, powers and principalities. Christ's victories flow into the whole of creation. Look at verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Oh, the Christian is aware that there are forces behind this world. Uh, this, of course, is uh, nonsense to the modern mind, which sees nothing other than the physical, and that's the end of the matter. But the Bible constantly speaks of a spiritual realm whose influence spills over into this world. Now, listen to Dick Lucas on this. The modern ignorance of our adversary, even within the churches, is a sign of our distance from apostolic Christianity. But on the other side, there is no call for the believing Christian to make too much of the strong man and his armory, since one stronger than he has already appeared to overcome him and take away the weapons in which he trusts. Powers and authorities sought to destabilize the Colossian church and indeed upset all of us. As Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But Christ humiliated and disarmed these powers and authorities, defeating them at the cross, whether they be cosmic or angelic or demonic, they are rendered powerless against us. Victory over Satan and all his cohorts, all his hosts. We are victors through Christ in every sense. If you are a Christian, then spiritual warfare is a reality for you. Christ defeated the powers and authorities that war against you, those powers that uh, taunt us with dangerous thoughts, who tempt, who tempt us with worldly teachings, who mess with our feelings and who seek to rob us of the hope that is stored up for us in heaven. Christ has disarmed these powers and authorities. The strong man has been defeated. The spiritual battle has been won, although not fully experienced at the present time. That will come, the victory, in all its fullness when Christ returns. The breadth of victory won for us by the cross. Debts removed, sins forgiven, and alive with Christ. And powers and authorities have been stripped of their force in submission to the Christ who won the victory. Notice, therefore, the exclusiveness of Christ's victory. There is no other victory like this one, whether it be things on earth or things in heaven, through the blood, through his blood, shed on the cross, God is reconciling to himself all things. Christ the victor. How then should we live in view that Christ is Lord, that Christ is Saviour, and all things are under him? Well, look at verse 8. 
See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. See to it that no one snatches you away from Christ. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of those Taken movies with Liam Neeson. Uh, in the 2009 movie, Neeson plays a former spy whose daughter is kidnapped and he tracks down the ruthless gang who abducted her. See to it that you are not kidnapped by hollow and deceptive philosophies. Well, the captain of a ship looked into the dark night and he saw faint lights in the distance. Immediately he told his signalman to send a message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. And promptly a return message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain was so angry that his comment had been ignored. He sent a second message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain. Uh, soon another message was received back. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am seaman, third class Jones. Immediately then the captain sent out another message, a third message, knowing the fear that it would invoke. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. Then the reply came, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. In our dark and foggy times, all sorts of voices are shouting orders in the night, telling us what to do and how to adjust our lives. Don't listen to these voices. The Bible, God's word, is the only voice that we should listen to. God has promised no more words beyond the words that he has written to us in his scriptures. See to it then, that no one snatches you away from Christ. See to it that you are not kidnapped by hollow and deceptive philosophies. Oh, the Colossians contended with false teachers in their world and they contended with their wild ideas which demoted Christ and encouraged all sorts of strange religious practices. Oh, in those days for the Colossians, it was Greek and Jewish ideas that were the influence which tugged at the Colossian mind and heartstrings. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Have you ever been tempted to wander away from Christ? Don't go there. Don't do it. Don't listen to the voices of this world which are vacuous and hollow and deceptive. Oh, there are strands of thought in this world which claim to be Christian but deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the reality of sin and the need for forgiveness. They say that the cross is no more than an inspirational example of sacrificial love and there it stops. Uh, theirs is a philosophy that denies the virgin birth and the divinity of Jesus. They claim that the early church made up the miracles of Jesus in a way to validate him. And then there's New Age thinking, which confuses the creator with the creation. They say that God is more a force than a person. God is everything, and everything is God is their motto. Our pantheism sounds a little like Star Wars. Obi-Wan Kenobi described the force as an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Or if we believe that there is no such thing as truth, we throw the gospel to the wolves for it becomes one opinion among many opinions. But of course, why would anyone believe the truth that there is no such thing as truth? To believe this is at least to believe in one truth. It's a self-contradiction. Friends, we are complete in Christ and there is no point looking elsewhere. It is not possible to add to the achievements of the cross. Fullness and freedom are found in Christ. Look at verse 9. In Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells. And then verse 10. In Christ you have been brought to fullness. Christ is fully God and you are fully in Christ. 
There is therefore nothing lacking between yourself and God. In Christ, you know the source of life. Has someone come to Christ for salvation? Then he is found in Christ, all fullness for life. In verse 11, Paul uses circumcision to describe our coming to Christ. It sounds like he's speaking to a particularly Jewish audience there uh, for whom circumcision meant a lot. Who is it that belongs to the people of God? It is, is it those who have been circumcised, who have received circumcision? Now look at verse 11. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. See, who is the real Jew? Who is the one that belongs to Christ's church over which Christ is head? It is the one who has the mark of Christ, the one who has discarded their sinful nature. The Jew is physically circumcised, but he may not have a circumcised heart. And the Gentile who is not circumcised may have a circumcised heart. For the true sign of the covenant is the circumcision that Christ brings through faith in him. True circumcision then happens not with a knife, but with a uh, descent with Christ into the grave who dies, the one who died for us. And true circumcision means rising, being raised with Christ to new life. So since you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, see to it that no one takes you captive because God has made you alive in Christ. Your certificate of debt has been paid. You are forgiven by God and you are alive in Christ. Christ is fully God and you are fully in Christ. Religion is very confusing these days. Keep it simple. There is no need to look further than Christ. You started the Christian life with him, now continue to live in him and pray that you will live a life worthy of the Lord, uh, living a life of thankfulness and praise, a life which seeks to please him in every way. The Christian life is not a complicated one. All you need for life is found in Christ. All you need for death is found in in Christ. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ. All fullness is found in him. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one who is the Lord of all and who amazingly reconciles the whole of creation to him. Thank you that in the Lord Jesus, Right. We receive blessing upon blessing that our debt has been paid, that we are forgiven. And we thank you so much that through faith we are alive in Christ. Father, help us to keep it simple, to keep our eyes truly and firmly fixed upon Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Help us not to be distracted by the hollow and deceptive philosophies of this world, but to keep our eyes firmly upon him. So whether we live or whether we die, we are assured that we belong to Christ. Amen.
Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul, with my Savior watching over me, I can see the billows roll. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, oh, the Well, I hope once again that uh, your time with us has been a blessing today. Um, as you go forward this week, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you in, in a very fresh and real way. Not just with you this week, but forevermore. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.